stand up and you read God's Word, you respect His Word, every word of it. Our message this morning is Jesus settles the sisters. And you may have heard this account, let's read it afresh today, Luke 10, starting with chapter verse 38. Now it happened as they went at the end of a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from this is the Word of God for the people of God. Praise you, God. Raise your hand if you have a sister. Raise your hand if you are a sister and you have a sister. There's two, two girls in the family. Okay. Have you all ever squabbled in the last 24 hours? Squabbling sisters. Karen and I know a lot about that too. Karen actually has four other sisters. Squabbling sister, she knows a lot about it. Uh, you know, Brenda, Pat, Sherry, Marty, and Pam. That's all your mom's sisters, right? I'm sure they've had a squabble or two growing up. And now they're older, they'll get along. Bristol and Riley Wall, I'm sure they squabble. Kylie and Cameron and Kennedy Jackson, I'm sure they squabble. squabble. Jaylee and Jazzy Kemp. And Meredith and Maddie, I've got your name on here, Meredith. Uh, the Marbles, they squabble from time to time. What do they squabble about? Their clothing, the bathroom, the car, their hair, their tops, their shoes. Pam Brown says, if your sister is in a tearing hurry to go out and cannot catch your eye, she's wearing your best sweater. She's gone. Martha and Mary are two grown sisters who still live together in the village of Bethlehem. Bethany is only a couple of miles from Jerusalem towards the east. If you go out of Jerusalem, down the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, it's not a very big hill, you go over the hill towards Bethany. They live so close to the Holy City, but they're not acting like Holy Sisters. One of the sisters is being contrary. Which one? Martha demands that Jesus get involved to settle the sisters. They are worked up. And since they are personal friends with Jesus, Jesus can come right out with it. Of course, Jesus can come right out at any time and just tell us what's happening. But it's easier with friends. You just say, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. Mary's chosen the better part. It won't be taken from her. So Jesus settled it. He's not going to have Mary go to the kitchen. Martha, she is not going to help you. Martha is distracted. Mary is focused. In Bible study, we call this a contrast. A clear contrast. Distraction and focus. If we look at, at the Greek word that, that Luke uses to describe Martha up in verse 40, that she was distracted or cumbered, it's more than just distracted. The Greek word shows that she is pulled, pulled in different directions. You, you can't keep a lot of focus if you're pulled in different directions. This and that, food and drink and clothes and calls and company. She is distracted. The verb is in the passive mood, which means she receives the action of the verb. She's the one that's being pulled apart. She's the one that's being pulled in different directions. John Wesley notes, has a note about this passage. He says, Martha was encumbered. The Greek word properly signifies to be drawn different ways at the same time and admirably expresses the situation of a mind 
surrounded, as Martha's then was, surrounded with so many objects of care that it hardly knows which to attend to first. What, what do we do first? Do we knead the bread? Do we press the olives? Do we cut the potatoes? What do we do first? Martha was struggling. She was edgy. She was irritated. Distracted by the responsibility of serving. Now let's understand the context. The Bible says that they welcomed him. But in verse 38 it says, Now it happened as they went and he entered a certain village. The disciples are with him. Twelve other men. And then there were some women who traveled with the disciples to support them with food or, or various things. So this group that followed Jesus as their rabbi all came into Bethany. And many of them may have come into Mary and Martha's home. What is a woman's first response when company comes into the home? Could I get you something? Could I get you something to drink? Could I get you something to eat? Martha is very aware that she is supposed to provide hospitality. Mary is completely unaware of the need for hospitality. She is looking at Jesus, ready to hear him, listen to him teach. What a contrast between these two. All right, let's talk about distractions. What distracts you if you are reading a good book, if you are eating a good meal, what might distract you? How about if you are driving, what might distract you? Karen and I drove back from Louisville, drove to Louisville, and back from Louisville on Friday. She had a continuing education event. And I just went with her to be her chauffeur. Gerald, you do that sometimes. You don't want your girl downtown Louisville by herself. So you go. On the way back, I got hungry, and I pulled into a restaurant with a big yellow M. And I ordered two small CHs and fries, FF. And on the way we went. Karen got something healthier than I did, Patty, but I stuck with two cheeseburgers and fries. That's not my normal order. If I went to the Golden Arches, I would normally get a fish fillet sandwich because I love it, or a quarter pounder with cheese. Those are both quality foods. I'm not promoting this, although Pam Hancock is a part of our church. I just like it. Why did I get two cheeseburgers and not a quarter pounder? Meredith, have you ever tried to drive to Western and eat a quarter pounder at the same time? It drips wonderful things everywhere. So I had to get the little cheeseburgers so I could drive. And that's why. I didn't want to be distracted while driving. And actually, research has been done on things that distract drivers that cause wrecks. And eating and drinking in the car is one of those things on the list. But Patty, it's only 2% of wrecks from eating and drinking. And I was very careful. And Karen was handing me the food, so I wasn't even leaning over to rummage around the bag like we do. And I know you all do it. Because we do it. Let me read a few things to you and see if you can pick out the number one cause of car accidents from distracted drivers. What is it that distracts us from the road? Is it eating or drinking? Uh, Two percent is not very much. Is it adjusting the heat or the air conditioning or adjusting the radio? Just think about these in your head and we'll answer. Is it reaching for a device that you brought, like reaching for your headphones or reaching for a phone? Is it talking or listening to other people in the car? You're driving this way, you're looking that way. Is it looking at an outside object or an event like this? As I read the article, I learned there's a term, rubbernecking. When you stick your head out and turn it, sure enough, someone came into our neighborhood last week in rubbernecks and had to see what was going on. I just watched it. There it was. Could it be using a cell phone, dialing, talking, or even texting, or listening? Could the cell phone be the number one distraction? Or maybe by being lost in thought? Kind of daydreaming. Could that be the number one distraction 
What do you think is the number one distraction that causes us to wreck? Cell phone. What else did I hear? Texting a cell phone. What else? Daydreaming. The rubber necky looking up, looking at construction, what are they doing? Okay, let's see. Looking at outside object, Donald, is number third. It's number seven percent of wrecks are called by looking around like that. Surprisingly, cell phones only cause 12% of accidents. And Tony nailed the number one thing. Daydreaming is 62% of the wrecks we get. Two-thirds of them is because we're somewhere else. We need, to, we need to focus, definitely while driving, but even more so upon Jesus. Martha was distracted. She's about to cause a spiritual wreck by pulling Mary away from Jesus. Jesus says, no. Martha herself is a wreck because there's so many guests and there's so much food to prepare. And she's so stressed out because she wants to make a good impression and wants to do the right thing. She doesn't want to be talked about at the well in the morning. Did you know that Martha didn't serve food when the master came? Oh, what a terrible hostess. Those are all the things running through Martha's mind. She's, she's pulled to prepare the food. She's pulled to prepare the table. She's, she's a mess. Life is out of control. And so when she gets that stirred up, that irritated, and that angry, she looks at her sister. Raise your hand if you have a sister. And you've gotten angry at your sister. Have you ever gotten angry at your sister? Would you come help me? Perfectly fair request. Martha barks at Mary. Come help me. And she growls at Jesus. Lord, tell her to come and help me. Can you believe that? She invokes the Son of God to make her sister help her. What did Jesus do? He settled the sisters. He stopped the squabble. He said to Martha, no. Mary is not coming to the kitchen to prepare food. One thing is needed, Martha. Food is not what is needed here. The Word of God is what is needed. And Mary has chosen the better part. It will not be taken from her. That one thing needed, Mary gave Jesus her undivided attention. Undivided attention. Now, Meredith, I'm pretty much preaching to the choir. This generation knows how to have undivided attention. But you may have already got three texts and two emails while I'm talking to you. I got, I got a text during the opening song, and I haven't read it yet. <gasps> what is it? You know, it just, it distracts us. Older folks don't care. They want to focus. If you're older, you're used to sitting on the front porch and talking face to face. Being together, pull out the guitar, pull out the banjo, pull out the bass, play music on the front porch, sing, wash dishes together. Mildred, Mildred, Matt, have you ever washed dishes by hand? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? Mary's like, what? Wash dishes by hand? It used to happen. And you used to, one used to wash and one used to dry. And you used to talk. The sisters would talk and mama would be there and even swept the floor after each meal. Contact time together. Mary is in her own home. Jesus is sitting there teaching. She lets him speak. She listened to him speak. She waited for him to speak. Didn't matter if Martha was texting her, get over here. No. She didn't. And as, as Mary is focused on Jesus, she was being freed. She was being fed. She was being filled. She was being formed. When that kind of beautiful bonding is happening, when you are being made like Jesus because you're watching Him and you can imitate Him, you can, you can learn from Him, don't interrupt Him. Don't interrupt that. Our spiritual enemy is a master of trying to interrupt that. Is it any wonder that Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount that when you pray, go to your prayer closet 
Shut the door so no one can distract you. And talk to your Father in Heaven. Give Him your undivided attention. Talk to Him and listen to Him and you'll be blessed. You'll be prepared. You'll be powered. You'll be peaceful. Now so far most of this message has been about distractions and about Martha. And if the whole message was about Martha, we would have missed the point. Let's turn our focus to Mary now. Mary is not just sitting on the couch like a couch potato. Mary is not daydreaming. Mary is not on her cell phone. She is sitting at the feet of Jesus, probably on the floor, on a hard floor, looking up at Jesus. She is gazing at the face of her Lord as He teaches the people He loves. She is focused on the Son of the living God, feeding on each word that comes from His mouth. She is fixed on the radiance of God's glory manifest in His Son. She's not in a daze or a craze or a phase. She is spiritually focused. She is giving Jesus her undivided attention. At Jesus' baptism, God the Father spoke. He said, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Listen to Him. Mary is listening. She is being spiritually free as she listens to Him. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. She is hearing it and being set free right there in that room. Mary is being spiritually fed. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Martha, put down that kneading trough. Come over here and sit down and let me feed you. Mary is being fed by the bread of life, the Word of God, the Word made flesh. And Mary is being spiritually formed. Paul says in Romans 12, that we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Mary's mind is being renewed, being made fresh, restored with the truth, the love of God. The disciples couldn't take in all Jesus' teaching. The Pharisees couldn't take in all Jesus' teaching. In John 3, Jesus is starting with basics with Nicodemus. In John 3.10, Jesus says to Nicodemus, You are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things? Who formed you? Nicodemus was incomplete. In John 16, 12, before Jesus is going to go to Mount Calvary, he says to his disciples, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. You can't handle it. I, have, I need to form you more, but you, but you can't handle it right now. Mary was being formed to be like Jesus. A Christian means to be a little Christ. To be like our Lord. Why on earth would Mary ever want to leave contact with Jesus for contact with Martha? Sorry, Martha, I'm not coming to the table to prepare food. I'm with the Lord who is preparing my faith. One thing is needed, and this will not be taken from her. We look back into the Greek word for not be taken, will not be taken. The, the meaning of this word means will not be lifted off of her. Mary was having beautiful things put on her. You might say she was receiving the yoke of Jesus. Didn't he teach us to take his yoke and to learn from him? She's doing it. She is receiving the yoke of Jesus Christ, the yoke of the new covenant of humility and gentleness. And now Martha wants to cut in, take off this beautiful yoke of truth and grace, and put on a yoke of works and weariness. No thanks. Mary says, no. I'm going to keep what I have. This is right. Now, If you and I were to experience Jesus in song, in message, 
in altar call, in testimony. If we were experiencing Jesus and we went past 12 o'clock, I hope you would let your roast burn. I hope you let your stew sit, your casserole cook. Leave it there. You might smoke up the house, well, it's all right. Stay with Jesus. It's well with your soul. Your stomach will be fed later. You see, if Martha had realized what could happen, Jesus could have taught and taught, and then Jesus could have said, now I'd like all of you to help Martha fix the meal. In a moment, that meal could be ready. Martha didn't see it from Jesus' view. Mary did. Mary saw it. Don't miss the moments with Jesus. Don't miss time with Jesus. We must be intentional and protectional about our time with Jesus. To relax and give Him our undivided attention. I close with this story about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, famous preacher. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was on the, on the way to his home church in a serious snowstorm. The snow prohibited him from making it to his home church. And so on the way to church, he stopped at a primitive Methodist chapel. The snow was so bad, the pastor of that chapel couldn't even get to the service. So a layperson, a layman spoke. And we are free to do that in the Methodist church. Now the layman didn't prepare a message. He probably didn't have a manuscript written out. He probably just looked over something quickly and stood up to try to bring a message to those who could come in the snow. Charles Haddon Spurgeon sat there and he heard Isaiah 45, 22. The lay speaker said, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And the lay speaker said a few more words, but he wasn't used to speaking. He came back to that scripture. And he would repeat that scripture over and over. From Isaiah 45, God would say to us, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Charles Haddon Spurgeon felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He came forward and gave his heart to Jesus Christ in that primitive Methodist chapter. And went on to be a powerful spokesman for Jesus Christ, bringing the word, bringing the message of God. Look to Jesus and don't let anything interrupt. Look to Him, look at Him, imagine Him, come into His glory, wait for Him, bring His word to Him. He will free you, He will feed you, He will fill you, and He will form you. Look for Him. Look at Him. Focus on Him. Look what He is doing. In these days, as in all days, we may think, oh, these days everything is falling apart. But Ecclesiastes, the author said, there's nothing new under the sun. The sinful world has been falling apart for 5,000 years. Jesus has come to save us. And He has sent us to save other people. Karen, would you come? She's going to lead us in the song, People Need the Lord. If you need Jesus, the altar is open. We'd be happy to pray with you for salvation, for healing, for comfort, for guidance. Happy to. For the day, it's still, there's still a joy. We don't go home heavy because we serve a risen Lord who is victor over the grave, who is victor over death, and victor over sin. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full of His wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. In you know the words, in the light of His glory and grace. God's altar is open. Jesus invites you to come for heaven.